For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. I'm going to talk about a subject tonight that will help you probably more in eschatology than in Genesis. Eschatology being a study of the last days. We, you might refer to it as the second coming of Christ or something of that nature. One of the things that people don't pay attention to are details and details of the will of God. And that's been our subject idea over the last few weeks on just about everything I've taught. And everybody knows there's 12 tribes of Israel. What they don't know is that God kept changing them throughout the course of history. So you might read the 12 tribes of Israel in one part of the Bible and it'll list one group. You might read another part, it'll list a different group. And when you get to Revelation, it'll mention another one. And people really don't pay any attention to who's moving, who's moving around inside there. Um, so I'm going to talk about the shifting within the tribes of Israel tonight. And as I said, it will become important to you um, in the church age when it, see, we don't operate the church age under the new covenant part, the church age under the new covenant this section of it doesn't, we're not interested in the 12 tribes of Israel. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't matter to us. Ten of them are gone, right? They're out of history. They'll, they'll be reassembled, but they're out of history right now. And, it, and Israel, they're kind of out of the loop. I mean, they're there as a nation, but not in the true sense of the word of God. They're, they're under a fifth cycle business. So, but when it comes to the tribulation, 12 tribes are going to be involved. When it comes to the new heaven and the new earth, 12 tribes are going to be involved. And you're going to find a different 12 tribes. There, there, there are shiftings within the structure of the 12 tribes. 12 tribes of Israel. So we're going to talk about that tonight. We're going to, we're going to look at that. I'm trying to prime you to, to, to be interested in this study because it involves the second coming of Christ. So, so here we are. Here is, here is part of it. Here is the first shifting is in 48. See if you can find it. Now it came out after these things that Joseph was told, behold, your father is sick. And that, that's like a deathbed sickness. I mean, he's sick, your father's. So he took his two son Manasseh and Ephraim with him. When it was told to Jacob, behold, your son Joseph has come uh, to you. Israel collected his strength and sat up in the sick bed. Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me. That, that, that was his um, calling, patriarch calling uh, of the Abrahamic covenant. I mean, that's what, that's what he's talking about. And he said to me, Behold, I will make you fruitful and numerous. I will make you a company of people. And will give this land to your descendants after you for an everlasting possession. So that's Abrahamic covenant business. That's patriarchal uh, um, leadership being passed on. 
And now your two sons who were born to you in the land of Egypt before I came to you in Egypt are mine. That's, that's really important. That little phrase there is really important because he's going to adopt him. Ephraim and Manasseh shall be mine as Reuben and Simon are. Simeon. In other words, he's going to bring them into the family inheritance as sons. Like Reuben and Simeon. Your offsprings that have been born after them shall be yours. See that? They shall be called by the names of their brothers in their inheritance. Say, your two sons born here, they're going to be part of the plan of God. They're going to be part of Israel. And so what he did is he took Joseph out and put his two sons in. What other, what other children you have is under your umbrella. These are under mine. Much, much like Le Leverite, but, but this is an adoption. This is adoption. Okay? And then he comes back uh, to Rachel. Um, you know, she was the love of his life and so he's going to take her firstborn out and put Joseph's two sons in. See, Joseph was her firstborn. Benjamin was, his, was her second. He's taken, Jacob has taken Joseph out and putting her, uh, his two sons in that place. Now we got 13 tribes. Okay. But who's counting? We have 13. And then he, 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 he mentions to Joseph how important Joseph's mother was. See, he had four wives, right? Jacob had four wives. And he's telling Joseph how important Rachel was to him, how important Joseph's mother was to him. I almost, I almost preached this on Mother's Day. I was, all, I was all ready to do that, and then the Father pushed me another way. But I, I thought, oh, I got me a really good Mother's Day lesson here, and the Father went, nah. So I went, okay, but I thought it was pretty good. And he went, nah. So let's have a word of prayer. And we'll get into this, the shifting within the tribes of Israel. As I said, this is more than history. This is pro prophetic history. I'm going to talk about prophetic history. Okay. I give you a moment of silence as a believer priest and dwelt by the Holy Spirit, church age. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Your, your bodies become the temple of God because the Holy Spirit dwells there. John 14, 16, he dwells there forever. You're a mobile church. You're a mobile sanctuary because of the indwelling Holy Spirit. And he is the key to Bible study. You can't study the Bible in carnality. Identity, identity, identity of carnality is personal sin. Could be mental attitude sin, sins of the tongue or bird sins. You confess them. You name him, you cite him, you state him to the Lord. He's the one who made all the provisions of cleansing. And with that comes forgiveness. And so in 1 John 1, 9, he says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. And that's those forgiveness and cleansing aren't positional, they're experiential. They're for your relationship with him. It's for fellowship. It's it involves sanctification, not salvation. So First John 1, 9, it would be important for you tonight, both those here with us in our service, as well as those who are visiting with us by the Internet. 
this is seriousness on the study of the Word of God. It's a spiritual book for spiritual people, and it has to be, under, it has to be studied spiritually. Father, we thank you tonight for these who have come our way to study with us, by, both by automobile and by Internet. We pray the Holy Spirit would minister truth to us individually as well as collectively. We've brought a collective message, but the Holy Spirit always teaches it personal. We're thankful to have that opportunity tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. I want you to look in your Bibles to Genesis 35. This is the original list. This is Jacob and his four wives. And, of course, most of you know the story behind how he wound up with four wives. That's not my subject tonight. And in verse 22 through 27, we have a listing, and they tell you how they go. Uh, Leah's sons, in verse 23, he, now in verse... The last part of verse 22, 22 says, These are the twelve sons of Jacob, and they are their wives and the children that came by them. Leah has six, and they're identified, Reuben, Sibion, Levi, Judah. They're all listed there. And uh, then Rachel, verse 24, Rachel has Joseph and Benjamin. And then the, the, the Belka, that's Rachel's maid that was given to Jacob, she had two. They're listed as Dan and Nathaltali. And then Leah's maid, Zelpha, was given to Jacob, and she had Gad and Asher. So I wrote them on your paper so you can see who they belong to. Leah has the six, Zelpha two, Rachel two, and Velka two. Now, for Rachel, for within our story, we're with jo Jacob and Joseph. This is that section's important, isn't it? The Joseph. The first shift under point one, the first shift that's going to come within the tribe of Israel is in our lesson text. It's Genesis 48, 1 through 7. And Jacob will replace Joseph with his two sons. Joseph is going to be taken out of the inheritance and his two sons are going to be included. We read that today. Now, and he's going to adopt them. He says, now your two sons who were born to you in the land of Egypt before I came to you in Egypt are mine. Ephraim and Manasseh shall be mine. Now, isn't it interesting because the order of their birth is Manasseh and Ephraim. But when they were brought to him, he reversed their names. And when it comes time to bless them, he's going to reverse the, them. Manasseh is the oldest, the firstborn, and Ephraim's the second. And when he crossed his hands on the blessing, Joseph said, wait, Dad. I know your eyesight's bad and everything. And I can hear this old man probably said to him, yeah, but my mind isn't. Uh, if you belong to my family, that's the way they talk. Well, I may have lost my eyes, but I haven't lost my sense. And so he tells him, no, I've, I've made the right decision. Because Joseph said, wait, Dad, your hand's on the wrong one. Don't pass that because you've got your hands on the second born, not the first born. Now listen why this is important. Every patriarch went under that system. Every patriarch went out of that system. The younger became the leader. When you go back and you study, you study uh, the Isaac and the Jacobs, you're going to see that to be a pattern. And it, it's true here. I mean, you know, we had uh, with Abraham, we had Isaac and Ishmael. Ishmael was first. No, that's not, that's not the plan, right? That wasn't the plan. Went to Jacob. Uh, yeah, come to Jake with the, went, to, went to Isaac. Then it comes Esau and Jacob. Esau was born first. Jacob, right, got it, but he got it. And so we have it again. Here, here he does, Jacob does the same thing here. 
Now that's really important. The firstborn is that's a big deal. Next week I'll do a study on the firstborn because firstborn, the firstborn that begins here uh, with. Uh, well, begins with Adam and goes all the way through. The firstborn's a really big deal. But the, real, the big deal in it is shadow Christology, the firstborn of God and, and us. Uh, we're identified in all that firstborn business. Well, anyhow. So in this passage, what happens is uh, Jacob adopts the two, Joseph's two sons, uh, Manasseh and Ephraim. Therefore, there's a change. There's a shifting uh, in the 12 tribes. Joseph is taken out. Esau and Manasseh is put in. But when they do it, we have 13 tribes. Now, here's what's interesting. These 13 tribes are positional and experiential. And they're going to last this way all the way until the exodus. Now, that may not seem like a long time to you. That's 430 years. 430 years <laughs> from this time. They're going to be under bondage for 400 years, and we're a little ahead of that. We're ahead of that by some 30 years. So we now have 13 tribes. The only time we had that, we have 13 tribes rather than 12. And they will exist until the exodus and the conquest. In other words, Moses, until Moses and Joshua. And uh, this is important to us in Exodus, the 12th chapter, verses 40 and 41. The second shift, sounds like work detail, doesn't it? The second shift, <laughs> the second shift came with the two senses that were taken in the wilderness of the, the exodus wilderness. The first census that was taken uh, was the original exodus generation. And so I want you to go to numbers with me. We'll look at numbers one. Numbers 1. Uh, Moses got, the Lord spoke to Moses in the wilderness in the tent meeting on the first of the second month in the second year after they'd come out of the land of Egypt. And he says, take a census. This is what we call the first census. Okay? This is the first census. And then he tells them that they're going to take them tribal. Right? And so now you begin to look in that first chapter, and they're going to go through a, a list of the sons. Okay? So, you know, we got Reuben, Simeon, Judah, and they go right through the list um, through verse 15, right? They go through that. Well, I guess I went through verse 16 uh, just to cover their identity. All right. Now, when you go through that list, you, you've got Reuben, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Start with Reuben is one, two, three, four, five. Then it says that six, see where it's verse 10, it says the sons of Joseph, Ephraim, and Manasseh. See, I got two. See, there's two. They, he doesn't refer to Joseph anymore. It refers to the sons of Joseph. Right? So there's our two. Then we got Benjamin, Dan, Asher. Then we, now who's missing? Two, listen, two missing. We know Joseph's missing, right? We know Joseph's missing 
in the first sense is because his two sons are there, right? Have been there for 430 years. Dan's there. Levi is gone. There's no Levi. Did you see that? No Levi. They're going to become the priest. You see? Yeah, blue jeans. Levi, that's where blue, blue, Levi blue jeans. It's probably, it's probably true, too. Uh, the reason Levi is absent is because he's been given priesthood status without land distribution. This will become a big issue when we get to the second census 40 years later. But you can read about that in Numbers. I'm, we're not going to read it, but you can read about the Levi absence here in Numbers 1, 47 through 54, and in Joshua 13, 18, they're not given any land. When the 12 tribes receive their land, they get none, but what they do get is 48 cities, and they're distributed. Every tribe has to give them some cities, 12 tribes and 48, and they'll vary because based on the size of it and all that, uh, but they'll be given cities, okay? And so that, you, and I've given you passages well worth your time to look at, like Joshua 21. Then we have a second census. The second one is with the, what we call the wilderness generation. The first one was taken with those who were originally in the exodus. They've died off, and a second generation is now up, ready to go into the promised land. Before they go into the promised land, a second census is taken. Okay? And then we get to Numbers 26. So we'll drop over to Numbers 26, and we're looking at, well, we, you know, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but when you go through that whole thing, then you'll, you'll, you'll pick up, now you're looking, you you're now looking, there's been a shift, so now you're looking for shifts, all right? We know that Joseph's out and Manasseh and Ephraim is in. Now we know Levi's out, right? Levi's out. Levi's out. Now, with that, we've got 12. We had 13, right? So Levi's out. Now we're back to 12. Now look, you suppose God knew that all along. You suppose these are mistakes being made or is this occurring? Listen, but listen, there were 13 tribes. One of the questions that might be at the gate, one of the pearly gate questions might be, how many, for 430 years, how many tribes were there in, in Egypt? Right? So maybe 13 is an unlucky number. We'd have to talk to some of those people. Um, now, the, the distribution of the land is based on an identity of the two, uh, based on these two senses, right? So we're going to have, the land is going to be distributed among 12 uh, disciple, disciples, among 12 tribes. Levi, one of the original sons of Jacob, is not going to get land. Because of his priesthood, he's, but other concessions are going to be given to him and 48 cities. That's not, that's not a bad inheritance, is it? Unless you had to manage him. Huh? That'd be a nightmare. Ask Trump how tough that would be. Um, in Joshua 14, 2, by a lot of their inheritance, as the Lord commanded through Moses, for the nine tribes and a half and then in Joshua 14 3 for Moses had given the inheritance of the two tribes and the half tribe beyond the Jordan so we've got the Jordan River running through here nine and a half tribes are on the west and two and a half tribes are on the east of the Jordan River. See that? 
Manasseh, Manasseh is one tribe, but they split. One came over here, and one stayed over here. And that's why you get a half. Now, they're considered a hoe, but this is what they did. And Joshua talks about that in Joshua 14. Reuben, Gad, and a half-tribe of Manasseh went on the east side. Now, if you know, in the back of your Bible, you have a conquest map that shows you this. It shows you territory and what tribe has it, right? Look in the back of your Bible. And look to a section called maps. And it should be closer to the front of the map section. Wouldn't be the first one. It would be the patriarchs. And then you keep moving. And you're going to find where there is a list. And all the tribes, you're going to see two and a half on the east side and nine and a half on the west side. Do you see that? Yes. I mean, if you have a study Bible, it's going to be there. What page are you on, uh, Pam? No, there's no page numbers back there. Uh, but but you can see them how they're uh, how they're in there. Now, when you look over here, it's not going to say that Manasseh is a half. It's just going to give their name Manasseh. It's not going to say a half. But you're going to find one here and one over here. But they're halves because. <clears throat> so you see that. The good thing about it, the maps will be with you when you get to heaven because, of course, they're part of the Bible, and the Bible is the eternal word of God, right? Uh, so you'll have those maps with you. All right? So now we have the land, the, the, all this Abrahamic covenant. We, we've, got, we've always had the land, but now we've got the, we've got the 12 tribes of Israel in the land, Right? This group, was interesting group, the two and a half, Reuben, Gad, and half a tribe of Manasseh, they grabbed that piece of land where they first came in and didn't want to cross over to go over here, and they just stayed. And they gave them concession on it. They said, okay, but understand, you're going to have to, you're going to, have to fight to keep it. <coughs> you know how blessed we are in America? Yeah, how blessed we are. We fought a lot of wars. We all fought one here. Well, actually two, right? The revolution and the civil. What, three? You won what one? Be careful now. The only reason I came south is to get, get, get my land. But then I had, to, I had to pay for it when I got here, so I don't know if that was a good deal. Um, <laughs> well, here, here we are at point three. Here we are at point three. The third shift came with the period of the monarchy theocracy under David and Solomon, First and Second Chronicles. First Chronicles is about David and Second Chronicles is about Solomon. But what is interesting about these books, and they're really interesting history books, is that they were written as historical documents to give, to remind those returning from the Babylonian captivity, the importance of their history, their, their divine history. Uh, your NAS, well, whatever study Bible you have, when you read the Chronicles, they'll tell you something like this that came out of the NASB mind. Chronicles was written for the exiles who had returned to Israel after the Babylonian captivity to remind them that they were still 
God's chosen people. That nothing, all the furniture being moved in your life doesn't change who you are in Christ. And that, that's important to remember in that. Doesn't matter how much furniture is being moved around in your life. You're still God's chosen in Christ. Israel was only chosen in Christ. Just like the church is only chosen in Christ. <clears throat> That's what the whole Levitical system was about. To make sure they understood the spiritual importance of their national identity as a priest nation. And that was Christ. So you can understand how bad it was when Christ actually came to the nation they, and they threw him under the bus. In First Corinth, in First Chronicles two, we have another listing. So let's go to Chronicles. Walk your way, pretty good ways. Go through the Kings to get to Chronicles. We get to Chronicles, and you can see it's an interesting. The writer starts right out. And if you have a study Bible, in the first chapter you have the genealogy of Adam and then Abraham and, and Esau and, 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 and now we get to Jacob. There's an there's interesting introduction here uh, and you go, like, why would he do that? Well, you got to know who this was being written to. And then he says, verse 2, verse 1, here, these are the sons of Israel. Got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Agreed? Yeah. On your paper, I did this for you. On your paper, the original group out of uh, Genesis, see that? I think it was in your introduction, right? So that's the same group. Right? Right? That's the original group. And why would he do that? Because they're talking to people who have been in the Babylonian captivity for 70 years. New people have come along. This is being written, many think Ezra, but this is being written for these people, it's some, it was one of the great prophets during that period. That's why many think Ezra. But to bring them back up to speed. Do you understand? Their children and that. Do I? Who? who? I see it in verse 2. Look in your Bible uh, at point at, at verse two. Yeah, second chapter, first two. Okay. There you go. You'll find them all there. Okay. You'll find them all there. The re and so it's important to know. See how important it is. See that's why they started with Adam and they moved all the way there. This this is really bringing everybody up to speed. The returning exiles would be from the, listen, this is important. This, this is being written. Now, remember, the ten tribes, they call them the ten tribes and two tribes. But, but, but over, you know, you're going to have, not, not that you can do this, but you're going to have ten tribes are, are gone. At 722, they're gone. See, when they, who he's writing to it, are people who are the South Kingdom, two tribes, two, two tribes, uh, plus the Levites, two tribes plus the Levites went with, they, went, went, uh, with the South Kingdom, okay? They went with David and his group. Now, so what you've got in, in this um, 
Chronicles, they're writing to, to the southern kingdom people. These are the southern. This is Judah. This is the southern kingdom, not the northern kingdom. Northern kingdom, ten tribes are gone. They, they're, they're gone. We, we don't know anything about them other than they're going to return. That, I mean, that's, that's, that's for sure. They're coming back. But we don't know where they are. They've been gone since 722. Just pff, gone. In, in 586 B.C., Babylon came in, and they took the southern kingdom out. Both of these went under the fifth cycle of divine discipline, Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28. They, listen, I can't tell you how many people don't know that even exists, and that's an essential part of biblical history. Because the fifth cycle is going to come back in 70 A.D. to take out the first century Jews by Rome which is a big deal, um, a big deal prophetically. So this is being written to the southern kingdom of these two tribes, right? Which are basically, basically you're talking about Judah and Benjamin, and then you, but you have the Levites who went with them. They stayed with the, with the southern kingdom. The returning exiles would be from the southern kingdom of Judah and Benjamin and the half-tribe of Manasseh, um, more than likely, and, and the Levites. Now, we know that that's a 70-year captivity period of the fifth cycle of discipline. So what is interesting, he lays them out in 1 first, in first Chronicles, the second chapter, verse 1-2, he lays out 12 tribes. Are you with me? Now, I can't do this with you tonight because I don't have time. I mean, I'm limited, and I know you want to go home. So, but on your own, you should read 1 Chronicles chapters 2 through 8 and look for the names of the 12 tribes. It won't be hard to find them if you have a study Bible. You're going to find, and I listed them. Okay? Two tribes are missing. Okay? Now, I know that unless you get a piece of paper out, I mean, you, when I say two tribes are missing, you're not even going to be able to find them. Unless you have a, if you, unless you've stayed up with how this is shifting, you understand that. So I tried to write them out every time to help you understand and what what is God what is God doing. When you read these, you're going to find two tribes are missing, Dan and Zebulun. They're missing. When you read through that, you're not going to come up. You're going to miss two tribes. All right. We are not told why. You can read First Chronicles and Second Chronicles, and you're not going to be told why. We don't know why they are missing. But most theologians believe the reason for Dan missing, and he misses a lot. He's like a kid who didn't go to school, doesn't understand why he couldn't graduate. Dan, most theologians believe the reason for Dan being removed is based on the tri tri tribal, Dan tribal group, it's national idolatry. And you really get a look at them in the book of Judges. In the Judges, especially 17 and 18, they were an idolatrous group. And you know God hates that. I mean, that's, that's the basic, basic premise of divine discipline is idolatry. He's a jealous God. Okay? In Judges 18.31, you'd have to read this historically and understand this Micah's idolatry 
But that was a big deal. Now, I'm not talking about the prophet now. I'm talking about a guy. Uh, so they set up themselves Micah's graven images, which he had made all the time that the house of God was at Shiloh. They just become absolutely corrupt. And we know that the, the, the fifth cycle, one of the main sins of it, of, of it, is idolatry. It's what got, hey, listen, it was the bugger boo with, with Saul. Now, his violation of the will of God, that was a big deal. But what he brought back to offer to God was idolatrous. And he was out. God could put up with a lot of sin and won't put up with any idolatry. Not that I'm encouraging to get involved in either one of them. So, we think that when you find tribes missing and not explained, the explanation is they got idolatrous. Because the other ones he explains, right? Joseph out, two guys in. Idolatry found a home with two tribes. Found a home with the tribe of Dan and the tribe of Ephraim. And Ephraim became the key person over the ten tribes, which eventually led to their downfall was idolatry. The fifth finally just took them out. You can read about this in 1 Kings 12, 28 through 30, and then again in Hosea 14, 8. Now, this brings us to a fourth shift that's coming our way. This fourth one is going to come our way. It's ahead of us. It's ahead of us. Now, we know Israel has no role in the divine plan as a nation. We live in a period when they have no, are they, the, are they still in the plan? Oh, yeah, but they don't have any role. They're not like the priest nation of Israel. They're still under a fifth cycle of discipline. They haven't regained the land. They're not under the Abrahamic covenant uh, plan of God. They ain't got it. They they haven't got the capital with the tab, uh, temple and all that. And none of this is back. But a fourth shift is going to come in the tribulation. The church will be raptured, and we go through seven years of tribulation for Israel. Seven years of tribulation for Israel. Israel. You can read about this. That's the famous 144,000, right? In Revelation. So let's go to Revelation. Revelation, the seventh chapter. Revelation, the seventh chapter. I'm at six, seven. You have a study Bible. They're probably talking about the remnants of Israel, 144,000 or something like that. Agreed? In verse 4, 144,000. I'm going to show you a key word. See verse 4? See the word sealed? Look in verse 8. When he gets through talking about all this, he's going to come back and he's going to say sealed. Now, sealed is a key word in the book of Revelation like it is in the church. It's, and it's the same word, sealed. Is sealed a big word in the church? Oh, yes. uh, yeah. He, listen, the Holy Spirit seals you unto the day of redemption. Ephesians 1, thir 13 and 14, fourth chapter, verse 30. Sealed is a big deal. <laughs> right? It's a big deal in the new covenant. Now we're extended over there. 
when Israel comes back, they're under um, the banner of, uh, of an old covenant concept. And they bring this, they bring this, I, but, but listen, under a, a, new, a, a new covenant concept of how Christ is going to deal with them. Right? All the way to the end of time. And so this, is, this becomes really interesting. There's probably been no other unique period in, in biblical history like, it, like the tribulation is. It brings back a seven years of old covenant under the banner of new covenant thinking. It's just a, a unique period of time. A lot of people miss that and they, they get messed up with, with this seven years. But I'm interested in who we're taking 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes. Agreed? That's how we get 12,000 out of 12 tribes is how we get 144,000. Now what we're looking for are the 12 tribes. Would you agree? We're looking for 12 tribes. So when you read Revelation 7, 4 through 8, you're going to find Dan is missing and Manasseh has replaced him. It is also interesting that Joseph is included, but not Ephraim. So now we got another a whole different shift within the structure. That's in the tribulation. And I think we all know why Dan and Ephraim aren't there. Aren't mentioned as tribal. Right? But now we're looking at the 12 tribes of which 12,000 are going to be taken, and that's the, the great ministry, 144,000. This is a great uh, missionary uh, work uh, in that seven-year period. Boy, you talk about, you talking about amping it up. But listen, <laughs> that sounds like a lot of people unless you think about what the church sends out into the mission field. The numbers are staggering. This 144,000 for just seven years, you realize what the church has done over our history is just unbelievable. There's probably been over the hit, and I hope Kniep is May, let's see, May, June, and July, August, September, and October. Kirk Kniep is supposed to come in and do me a a study. The School of Biblical Theology is supposed to come in and do a study on taking us from the Book of Acts, where missionary evangelism of the church begins, and carry us through to where we are today. And I'll tell you what you're going to find that the Church of Jesus Christ has worked through some of the most phenomenal client nations that are still power structures today and don't have an inkling of Christ in it. You know, as far as a national identity, like America is known as a Christian nation. There once was a time when, when almost every powerful nation in the world was known that way. Even China. That people go like, oh, you got to be kidding me. Uh, but, so we got this seven-year period, and 144,000 is a lot, and is a lot going out, really getting after it. Uh, and, and listen, they really pay a penalty for it, because now we're in the heated, we, now we're, listen, God's heat, uh, wrenched it up, and so is the devil. And these guys are going to pay, they're going to pay a heavy penalty for this. But who doesn't? We all fight the angelic conflict. Listen, every day we fight the angelic If you're not fighting the angelic conflict every day, you're not paying attention to what's going on in your life and you're calling it something else. <laughs> you're getting it. You're just calling it something else. Get your head in the Word of God and be able to talk to God about what's going on in your life because, listen, none of us are going to study the Word of God like this on a Tuesday night and not be part of the angelic conflict. Things are going on in your life. Things are coming and going through your life. 
And you need to know how to identify it, not get depressed. I mean, so many depressed Christians, they don't understand what's going on in their life. They don't know how to discern it. They don't study the Bible. No, study the Bible. What they call studying the Bible, we wouldn't even consider it studying it. We wouldn't even consider studying it. But anyhow, anyhow, one of the key words, I think, is the word sealed. Because we're going to come to a fifth shift. But before I go there, I want to leave this group with Isaiah, uh, with Jer Jeremiah 51.5. Now this was given to that exile group uh, in the Babylonian captivity. He says, for neither, and this is important prophetically, for neither Israel nor Judah. You know what he's referring to? He's referring to ten tribes and the, and the two tribes. He's talking about the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom when he refers that way. For neither Israel or Judah has been forsaken by his God. Now listen, this is in 586. And the north kingdom has been gone since 722. a couple of hundred years in there. I mean, if any of us that old, we'd forget some things, wouldn't we? How about that, Johnny? 200 years old. It's kind of tough where we are right now, isn't it? 200 years. I'm about to miss something. Like, what is your grandkid's name or something? But listen, neither... Neither the North Kingdom or the South Kingdom, neither Israel or Judah has been forsaken by God. Now, we love that. That's, that's our Hebrews 13, 5 in it. That he'll never leave you nor forsake you. This is part of the, that's part of who God is as our Father. <clears throat> and then, and, and no, no matter how God is treating them, he hasn't, he hasn't forsaken them. Right? All right, here's the fifth shift comes. The fifth shift comes with the new heaven, the new, in the new Jerusalem of the new heaven and the new earth. Now I'm in Revelation 21. And we're talking about the new Jerusalem with its wall built around it. We're talking about the wall. The fifth, sh fifth shift comes with the new Jerusalem of the new heaven and new earth of Revelation 21. In Revelation 21, 12, it says it had a great and high wall with 12 gates. And at the gate, 12 angels, and the names were written on the gates, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. And the wall of the city and the 12 stones. And on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So, in the city of New Jerusalem, of the new heaven and new earth, the wall that goes around the city of Trump will probably be assigned to build it. <laughs> The wall that goes around the city, the wall that goes around the city has got 12 gates. And the name of the 12 gates are going to be the names of the 12 tribes. And the wall of the city has 12 stones. On them are the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. What we are not given in 21 are the names of the 12 tribes. Many theologians believe they are the 12 sons of Israel that were sealed, that their names were sealed in Revelation 7. Okay? But there's others that believe 
that they are the ones listed in Ezekiel 48, 30 through 35. Right? <clears throat> so, we have the list of them there. And when you look at them and you study them, you will find that they're going to look just like the original list in Genesis 35. As my grandson would say, who can figure? <laughs> who can figure? Who can figure? So we're back. Which doesn't surprise us that we've gone this whole way and we wind up in a garden like we originally started and things have a way of coming around. But who knew? Okay. Shifting of tribes. The shifting of tribes. Well, um, let's have a word of prayer. And we'll let our friends from the internet leave us. Hope they've enjoyed our study with us. Hope they'll study these places. Go back and study all these things and check them out for yourself. Right? Be sure that I haven't missed something myself. Yeah. It's important you check my homework. Father, we're so thankful tonight for your love and mercy and grace. And What does all this mean in the big picture, Father? Well, it shows that God has a plan and that plan revolves around the person of Jesus Christ. And yet when he comes, the, the nation is going to kill him and think they've been rid of him. And he comes out of the grave. And that was a whoops moment. Because your plan moves on. We live in a day when the 12 tribes of Israel is not important, but we live in a day when prophetically it will be. And we're thankful, Father, that you don't forget your promises to people. That you'll never leave them nor forsake them like Jeremiah told them. We don't know where the 10 are, but I know they'll be back. So we see it today. Because you're faithful, Father. You're looking for faithful followers. I pray that would be us right here and those who are with us by the Internet. Be people of God. That could only happen in our dispensation if you believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead third day because no man comes to the Father except through Christ. In his name we've prayed. Amen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life.